on series. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be again in Ephesians chapter 6, where we're going to be talking a little bit more about this battle that we're in. If you remember from last week, it was really important for us to recognize that we are in a battle. And we celebrate in the fact that the war has already been won through Jesus Christ. We already proclaim the victory. When we look at the end, God wins. And if we're on God's side, we win. But that doesn't mean we don't face battles today. Last sermon series, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit and how we battle against our own flesh. And if we're busy doing spiritual things, we won't be doing sinful things. And this sermon series, we're going to be looking at battling the enemy in our world, in our culture, known as Satan. And we said last week that the greatest advantage of the enemy is convincing you there is no battle. And so if you think and you rest in the fact that you already won, that's great. But if you've been deceived thinking you're not in a battle today, have your eyes open. Be ready and willing to engage in battle. We also talked about the fact that the greatest tactic of the enemy is to convince you he doesn't exist. It's a conspiracy theory. There really is no Satan in the world. He really has nothing against you. But if he does exist, he's nothing more than a little long-tailed, red-headed, horned man who hops around and he dresses up at Halloween to try to scare children. He's really not an adversary. He's really not an enemy. And that's a lie. And it was quiet last week. I don't know if you remember. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Because if you know a little bit about me, I'm more of a playful, laughing type of person. I like to joke. But this kind of stuff... It's serious, and it's real, and I'm going to share some things with you this morning that are not meant to scare you. They're meant to expose the reality of the darkness of sin and the influence that Satan has in this world. And so if you'll read along with me in Ephesians 6 again, we're going to read the same scripture that we read last week. Paul says in Ephesians 6, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle was not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness and the heavenly places. As I said in Christ, we've already won the war, but that does not mean that we are not in a battle for truth, wrestling against sins of the flesh. We are certainly facing an enemy in our culture. I think one of the biggest challenges that we walk up against when we deal with wrestling against these satanic powers is that we often view victims of the enemy as the enemy. Has that ever happened to you? You view the person at work, the person in your family, the person from another church, the person from another, another religion as the enemy themselves. But more often than not, when I engage with people, People, more often than not, are victims of the enemy. They've believed the lie. They've fallen captive to the schemes of Satan. They've fallen into the trap. And when you approach this battle, if you view everyone as the enemy, you're not going to win. we got to go to the source. we got to cut the head off the snake, in other words. This battle is real, but it is against a principality and a power. Last week, we talked about the terms of the battleground. Do you remember what they were? False doctrine. Ultimately, false doctrine leads to unholy living. It's conceited, it's ignorant, and ultimately it is unholy. When we believe things that are false, we fall prey to the devil and his schemes. And we talked about this simple, this simple statement, right? There is no such thing as truth. And if you've wrestled in apologetics at all, what's the response to that? Well, is that true? And so we can't fall captive to this bad philosophy and a false doctrine that really does captivate our mind and our heart. We also talked about materialism, viewing the things in this life, the materials that we have as the most important thing. And when we value materialism, things above people, we lose. We talked about greed, wanting more and more of something. It could be money, it could be sex, it could be power, influence, social media likes, just this unnatural desire to have more and this unnatural sadness when you lose out. In fact, if you wrestle with greed, you will find yourself mourning at the success of other people in your life or even on social media. You'll mourn because you don't have it. We talked about sexual sin. We talked about the fact that sexual sin is going outside of the boundaries that God has put in place. And when we fall captive to sexual sin, God has a stronghold in our life. 
We talked about satanic influence. If you remember the church at Ephesus, they worship the goddess Diana. It's really a false god. It's a demon. And the way that they would worship her is through prostitution and temple sacrifice. There were a lot of religions stating all the way back to ancient Israel where they would worship through sex and child sacrifice. It's horrific. And do you think that's changed today? No, it hasn't. Unfortunately, it hasn't. It's truly horrific. Do you believe that the battle is real? Do you believe that you are fighting against Satan and that Satan is real? You know, this last week, news broke about Jeffrey Epstein. He is a multi-billion dollar hedge fund manager who is a serial pedophile. And he was arrested in New York for crimes against children and human trafficking. There's a picture I have up on the screen for you. He has an island in the Virgin Islands. It's called Epstein Island. The local people call it Pedophile Island. And what do you do at a temple? You worship through sacrifice. Jeffrey Epstein is known to be connected with some of the most powerful, elite politicians and businessmen in the world. This stuff is real. On this island sits a Luciferian temple, and it's believed that there is a large underground chamber of rooms and staircases beneath beneath the base. What are temples used for? Worship through sacrifice. Yes, there is a satanic pedophile elite who live in this world, who worship not God, but themselves and Lucifer. Last week, I listened to a terrible interview by a 21-year-old girl named Bella Thorne. She worked in Disney from an early age, and she talked about how she was sexually molested from the ages of 6 to 14, and everybody watched, and nobody did anything. Cully McCulkin has the same story. He's a Home Alone star. I watch his movies every Christmas season. He's exposed the movie business executives as satanic pedophiles, is what he says, who ritually abuse children in the industry. Maybe you heard about this news a year ago. Corey Feldman, he starred in Goonies. He talks about the satanic elite and how he was sexually molested as a young man working in the movie business. James Gunn, the director for Guardians of the Galaxies, he has thousands of tweets that were archived online about sex-abusing children. Last week, I watched an interview about a CIA operations officer, ex-CIA. His name's Robert Steele. I have a picture for you up on the screen. He has an opening statement at the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Human Trafficking and Sex Abuse, and it was organized by the International Tribunal for Natural Justice. This took place last year. In his opening statement, he estimated that there were between 600,000 and 800,000 children who are trafficked each year. Many of these children are born without birth certificates, and so you can't, they're untraceable. You don't even know that they're missing. He talked about prostitution mills where people are impregnated, the children are born, and then the mothers are killed. He mentions that there are practices of ritual torture and ritual murder, and horrifically, these children are murdered and consumed in an act of satanic worship. This is real. It happens. And I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying these things to expose the darkness with light. And if you still don't believe me, there's a woman pictured here. Her name is Marina. She's a known Satan worshiper who hangs out with Hollywood elite. She propagates spirit cooking. She wears upside down crosses. And she engages some of the most popular people that we know today. Another picture here is her with Jay-Z. She's been seen with Beyonce, Lady Gaga, politicians, powerful people. And these are all people that we look up to. We listen to their music. We watch their movies. We buy their, their things. We attend their concerts. These things happen. Last month, the BBC News reported on June 7th about Scottish satanic parties where priests would molest and rape children. These horrific acts go unnoticed. They go unreported. And we're just now, within the last three years, finding out all of these things have happened right under our noses. And no, it's not that nobody knew. It's that it was never exposed. But there is an awakening that's taking place across America. There is an unraveling of the satanic schemes against us. And we are going to stand strong against the crimes against children and against ourselves. 
And so when we look at these very dark things, when we see these crimes that are so heinous and so devious, our instinct is to say, this is impossible. There is no way something like this could take place. This has to be a conspiracy theory. Well, my encouragement to you is to do your own research. Investigate it for yourself. Look these things up for yourself and come to your own conclusion. But these things are not new. One of the reasons why God sent Israel into Babylon is because they were worshiping the God of Molech through child sacrifice and sexual prostitution. The same thing in the Greek culture. The same thing in the Roman culture. The same thing all over the world. Aztecs, Mayans. You see, last week I said Satan's methods haven't changed, just the idols have. And instead of worshiping a different God, we worship ourselves, or in this case, Lucifer. But we need to be aware of Satan's schemes. We need to have our minds ready, and we need to put on the armor of God. Because while these things are scary, and yes, these things do scare me, we can have the courage of Christ. You see, Paul said the source of our strength in Ephesians chapter 6 comes from the Lord. And this is what I like about Paul is Paul was willing to lose his life, reckless abandonment. He did not care what man did to him. He was focused on truth. And so he says in Ephesians 5.11, do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. Point them out. And that's what we're here to do. And so if you're afraid, you have right to be afraid. This is evil. This is dark. These are spiritual forces of darkness at work, but we can put on the Lord. And that's what Paul says. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This strength, this power is available for you and I. We do not have to fear darkness. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You anoint my head with oil. In other words, this powerful metaphor that David says is even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God, you are all around me except below my feet and we are marching on to victory. You see, the strength comes when we put on the armor of God. It is an armor that God supplies. And here's what's so important to realize. This strength, this power does not come from within us. It comes from what God supplies. You are not just going to wake up one day being supernaturally zapped by yourself with your own strength and your own power to fight against these dark forces that are at work. The picture that Paul paints for us in Ephesians 6 is the Lord as a mighty warrior leading his army to victory. You know, when I taught in the children's classes as a youth minister, we would sing this song, I'm in the Lord's army, and all the kids would go, yes, sir, and they would march around the room because we are in this thing together. You are not a gladiator alone in an arena. You are not separated on an island by yourself. We are fighting this battle together. We are defeating the strongholds of Satan together. And one of the ways that Satan schemes against you is through isolation. Nobody cares about you. Those people are too weird to hang out with. I mean, look at what they talk about on Sunday morning after all. Satan wants you isolated. He wants you cut out. He wants you disconnected. He wants you to feel like that you are not a part of something bigger than yourself. You know, it's one of the reasons why I think Donald Trump hosts these rallies is because if you were to watch mainstream media, who's really controlled by what I think to believe uh, greater powers that be, whether it's the deep state or whatnot, but if if you look at, at, at the mainstream media, you would think that nobody is a Republican. And if you are, you're a very small minority. And I think one of the reasons why Donald Trump holds rallies is because he wants to show, look, there are a lot of people who might disagree with my moral choices, who might disagree with some of my policies, but for the most part, there are a lot of people who are in this thing together. That's one of the reasons why Democrats do the same thing, right? The whole point of hosting a rally is to what? Everybody gathers together. Look at this movement. There is power in number. I'm not saying you should be a a Democrat or Republican one way or the other. I'm simply saying there's there's power in numbers, And that's what God wants you to understand and recognize. You are not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of people who boldly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, who fight back against these forces of darkness, who will stand alongside you and fight with you if you are willing. You are not alone. That's what Ephesians 6 teaches. And so when we ask ourselves this question, 
Why do we need this strength? Well, he puts it pretty matter of fact. First of all, he says to stand against the schemes of the devil. He uses this word, stand firm. It literally means this, you don't give an inch. You don't back down. You don't give any ground to the enemy. And so we must be ready and willing to fight. Paul put it like this to Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do you think it's a coincidence that the church has been subject to infighting for the last couple hundred years over stuff that really doesn't matter? When the communion is served, when it's, when it's given, how it's given, the music style that's played, the structure of the building, all of these things that in the grand scheme of things, they don't matter. But yet they get the majority of, of our attention. You know, when I talk with people or people email me, nine times out of 10, it's one of these structural non-essential issues and that's our distraction. Do you think that that's a coincidence? Do you think it's a coincidence that you're not out there researching human trafficking, sex slavery, people who are sick, people who don't have food? I mean, why is it that we're focused on these things that don't matter? It's because the enemy is at work. He's scheming against us. He distracts us with things that do not matter because he's looking at the big picture. He's looking at the war. And if he can get you distracted on the non-essentials, you won't make a difference. You'll lose the battle. Satan has schemes. He has arts, deceit, craft, trickery. These are all synonyms for this word schemes. But we are not ignorant of his schemes as Christians. Paul put it like this. He says, Satan appears as an angel of light, but he also says we are not ignorant of his schemes. There is nothing more than Satan wants to get you to think that he doesn't exist, he's not working against you, and you are entitled to your sin and your selfishness. There's nothing more than he wants. If he can get you focused on infighting in the church rather than out there making a difference, he wins the battle. When Paul talked about this fact that he's not ignorant of Satan's schemes, he's, he's literally saying, I am extending forgiveness to the people who harmed me because I know that Satan is at work. He wants nothing more than for us to hold on to our bitterness and our anger and our maliciousness and to hurt people around us. That's what he wants. But Paul says, we're not ignorant. And I've forgiven and I moved on, and I preached the gospel, and I'm not going to be distracted. You know, some of Satan's schemes, as we've talked about, they involve false doctrine. They involve enticing people to the desires of their flesh. They involve bringing persecution on the church. I mean, you want to talk about standing up for Jesus at your work or your school or amongst your peers and your friends. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You believe in truth and morality. And you think that that persecution hasn't been timed perfectly? There are schemes that are at work against you to discourage you, to make you fearful and afraid. Why do we need this armor? To stand against the schemes of the devil? Number two, to wrestle against spiritual hosts of, of wickedness. This word wrestle means to struggle. It's a, it's a wrestling match. It's a literal fight. This word is used of close hand-to-hand combat. Now, I made the big mistake at the last church of starting a boxing club for me and the youth group. <laughs> Approval by the elders, okay? But I could not wait. Man, I had some kids in my youth group that I just really wanted to lay out. Isn't this awful? Uh, they joined in. Everybody had to agree and you had to sign. But we uh, did the smart decision of fighting on a concrete slab. So our brains were really engaged in this moment, okay? I'm 21 years old. Well... I decided to co-sponsor it. Another guy was really excited about it. His name was Carter, and uh, he, would, he was a, you know, a former convict, a big burly guy who uh, worked in construction. He would participate in some of these tough man competitions, and so I made the grand mistake of deciding to box Carter Fox. So what goes around comes around, in other words. He hit me so hard on this side of my head, I thought he hit me on this side of my head. That's how bad it was. But you know what? <laughs> I developed this tactic. So we basically had no rules, okay? So what I would do is we would just break when everybody needed a break. So you know what I would do? I'd throw a bunch of punches, and I was like, man, I need a break. <laughs> and then I'd throw a bunch of punches, then I'd say, I need a break. And I did this about four times, and finally he called me out on it. He's like, this is ridiculous, man. You can't take a break after you hit me. It took like 40 seconds of boxing, and I was ready to throw up. That's how out of shape. I was, and that's how tough boxing is. When you wrestle, for those of you who have been wrestlers, it's about 20 seconds of wrestling and I'm sick to my stomach. I mean, wrestling is absolutely exhausting. You are constantly engaged the entire time. And if you wanna win, 
You've got to get trained for it. You've got to get ready. Now apply that to your spiritual battle. We are in hand-to-hand combat with spiritual forces of darkness, with satanic powers. How long are you going to be able to stand up and box? How long are you going to be able to wrestle with, before you give way, before you get sick and worn out and tired? This is the real deal. God gives us tools to fight back. And that starts with the Lord's power through the armor of God. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of a fortress. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, Paul says, we are in a battle of ideas. We are battling for truth. We are battling for doctrine. We are battling for morality. We are at war with philosophies, and we're fighting back. And the kind of war you're in determines the kind of weapons that you use. And so my question to you is, are you making the decision to put on the armor of God, not once, but every single day? Are your eyes open to the bigger picture? Do you see the war and the battle plans that have been laid out against you? Do you recognize your enemy is at work scheming against you to pit you against your spouse and your children, to get you to hate your job, to make you in love with social media and apathy, to where you are so exhausted at your free time you can't do anything but self-manage your sleep? That is the war that we're in. Or maybe you're just too entertained. You're too into your entertainment and your hobbies to do anything real, to stand up and fight back. You know, not only Satan we battle against, but he says we battle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. These are angelic, demonic hosts who serve the devil. Yes, demons are real. Yes, demon possession happens. And yes, the enemy has changed his schemes. And so now what do people say? Well, of course demon possession doesn't work or isn't real. Now we know it's mental health. If you were Satan and you knew and watched scientific development over the years and you knew the conclusion was going to be reached that mental health was real, what better way to categorize demon possession as nothing more than mental health? Wouldn't you change your battle plans? Wouldn't you pull away from demonic possession in areas where scientific exposure and knowledge has really increased and gained and focus on third world countries. I have seen demon possession myself. I have witnessed it on my mission trips to the Dominican Republic. It is real and it is evil. He says, we battle against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. They are chief princes of evil who sway political rulers and empower them with demonic influence. We see this in Old Testament scripture. The king of Persia, the king of Greece. This is all through um, the book of Daniel. These are powers that represent political figures with the influence of demonic activity. It is real. And you can best believe there are political powers today that we're fighting against, that worship evil and pain and suffering that seek control. And you know what? You know what their end game is? It's not money. It's not influence. It's not power control. It's exposure. The reality that you don't know what really goes on. You don't see what really takes place. That's what they fear the most. And so we get smoke screens. We get lies and deception. You know what the Bible calls Satan, Jesus specifically in John chapter 8, verse 44? the father of lies. This is his work. This is his art. Mass deception. The number one plan of the devil is to thwart the plan of God to get you to be unsaved. There are certainly demonic forces at play. And so demonic possession is not nearly prevalent as it is, it is, as it is today as it was back then, but we deal with what Paul tells Timothy, a doctrine of demons. Let me read this to you in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of what? Demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, they have seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. In other words, these people teach and preach something so much, they believe the lie themselves. And they have seared their moral conscience to such a great degree that heinous acts of evil are no big deal to them anymore. Here are are a few examples of what they would eventually do. Men who forbid marriage 
and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared and by those who believe and know the truth. You want to look at other religions, other Christian denominations, other cults. Look at, look at the foods they abstain. Look at the marriages they abstain from. Certain people that are in the laity aren't allowed to marry. Do you think that's by coincidence? This is a prophecy. Paul says this is coming down the pipe. They're going to refrain from marrying people, and they're going to refrain certain foods. It's true. And we may not fully understand how the rulers of darkness operate, but we can see that we need God's strength. We need his armor so that we can stand against the satanic power. And so here's what Paul says in verse 14. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Not just the helmet, not just the breastplate, not just the boots, not just the waistband. You got to put the whole thing on because he's watching and he's scheming. And if he can get everything right but truth, he wins. If he can get you everything right but the gospel, the feet of the gospel, he wins. And so we've got to put on the whole armor of God. First of all, he says this, put on truth. He says it serves like a belt. Now, I've got a belt on this morning. This isn't what Paul's probably talking about. He's not talking about this piece of material that would go on and wrap everything in. What he's talking about is more kind of like this inner waistband that would keep everything tight and it would protect the vital organs. That's what he's talking about. It is the undergarment of everything else. Everything else is built off of this. And so what do we do as, you know, when we come to church, right? Nine times out of the 10, I've got an undergarment shirt. It keeps everything nice and tight. <laughs> so I'm not all floppy and flabby around here. You know what I mean? We, we do this. We keep everything nice and tight. Our pants, our underwear, our socks, everything is nice and tight. It's so uncomfortable wearing socks or wearing shoes without socks, okay? The only people who are allowed to do that are ones who wear sandals. That's, what, that's what's appropriate. But that's what we do. That's what Paul's talking about is this undergarment, all right? I'm not trying to be lewd or weird. I'm just saying this is what Paul's talking about. And here's why. There's a point. This leather apron worn beneath the armor, um, it would be the foundation for the entire outfit. And what does he call this undergarment? Truth. Truth. Truth is real. Do you believe that truth exists? Is there such thing as an absolute truth? Is there right and is there wrong? Is there God's way and then there's not God's way? Do you believe in truth? It is essential for the armor of God. It is the foundation of who we are. Let me drop a truth bomb for you. Nine times out of ten, I don't get political, but I do stand up and I do speak out for things that I think are right and things that I think are wrong based off of the Bible, okay? And so whether you vote Democrat or Republican, Independent, Libertarian, whatever it is, I'm not talking about politics this morning. I'm talking about truth. And so do you know why the Born Alive bill, which basically is a bill that's meant to save children who are born alive from a botched abortion, do you know why it's been rejected 70 times on the House floor? Ask yourself that question. Have your eyes open. Look and see what's, what's really going on. Why would they deny this? What is the answer that they're given? And then what's the real answer? Well, if you know anything about abortion, you'll know that there's a bottom line, that if there's less abortions, there's a bottom line that's going to get cut. In 1999, there was a list that was leaked about aborted parts for a child. And after you add them all up, it's about $6,000 per aborted child. And you get a 30% discount if the organs are damaged. And we've seen people on Project Veritas and people online who have exposed this abortion industry that sells children that have been aborted. Ask yourself this question. The people that benefit the most financially from abortion, right? Why are they standing against this born alive bill if abortion really is about women's rights? I mean, after all, I mean, this is a child. It's not about the mother, it's about the child. And if it's born alive, it should be kept alive. But you've got this belief, this idea, like the governor of Virginia, who says if a child is born alive, we'd discuss it with the mother, and then we would consider our options, as if there's any other option than to save the child's life. Now, on average, there's 56 million abortions a year, times $6,000 bare minimum, prices have increased, and you get more money if the child is intact and later on in the pregnancy, late-term abortions. Look at it yourself. Do you really think that's about women's rights? Or it is about the multi-billion dollar organization we know as Planned Parenthood. 
and then follow the money. That's what, you know, that's what the crime investigators always say, follow the money. Who benefits from Planned Parenthood? Where, do their, where does their money go? Who do they donate to? The reality is we are not exposed to the truth because Satan is the father of lies and he gives us smoke screens about what is true. Or consider, you know, open borders. I mean, I know this is a political issue. I think these people need to be helped. They need to be taken care of. They need to be provided for. And it probably should come from our own charitable responsibility and not requiring everyone to chip in if they don't want to. Look, if you want to send money to people to care for them, do that. Don't just say, well, the government should do it. That's socialism. That's communism. And it never works. But ask yourself this question. How in 2008 did open borders become one of the leading policies in which an election was won off of? Close our borders. Secure our country. But now you would think that open borders are something that we should approve and, and we should welcome and we should support. The question is why? What's the surface level answer? And then what's the real answer that benefits and, under, and is underneath that? Do you know that in the sanctuary cities they give illegal aliens license? They count them in the population. And when you count them in the population, that goes to the electoral college, determining how many votes go to a specific state. And when you give somebody a license, you give them the ability to cast a vote. And so if you win a state that has more electoral college votes and you've got more people voting for your party, who does it benefit and why? It is absolutely true the open border policy has been one of the leading causes of human trafficking in our area. Who are people that are benefiting at this? It is absolutely true that almost 30 cases of people bringing their children across the border are from people who do not belong to, their, to themselves as parents or as children. It's not even their kids. I'm not asking you to go on one side or the other. I'm not asking you to vote one way or the other. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Open your eyes to the schemes of the devil and look at who's at work here. Look at who's at work and put on the armor of God. And so he says, start with truth. Jesus says this in John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I don't know all there is to know about our world and about the schemes of Satan, and what goes on. And I know a lot of people are suffering because of it. But there's one thing that I know that I'm responsible for. That's to put on the waistband of truth. You and I are responsible for seeking out truth. Not about political affiliation. Not about who's in your corner and who's not. What is true and what is right? You know, for us as Christians, truth provides this ready base for us to act. And he goes on to say this. He says, put on righteousness. It's like a breastplate. Now, this breastplate was about 40 pounds, and it was light. Considered most of us carry 40 pounds. We're like, what am I doing, right? Uh, that's our culture. But this breastplate was about 40 pounds, and if you stood about 20 paces away and you were to shoot an arrow at that breastplate, it would make a minor scratch. That's how, that's how strong this was. And you know what he calls the breastplate? Righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. And there are, there are two things I want you to know about righteousness. First of all, when you become a Christian, you get what's called the imputed righteousness of Christ. He judicially declares you not guilty. The imputed righteousness of Christ is like standing in a courtroom with God as the judge, and he looks at you, and he hammers the gavel down, and he says, not guilty. You're not responsible anymore. Your punishment is now put on Jesus. And we can walk away and live our lives in the freedom and in the grace of God. We win the war through Christ. But you've got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. But there's another aspect to this. And I think that this is what Paul is really getting at here. The breastplate of righteousness in this passage of scripture is more referring to our personal righteousness. Doing what is good. Doing what is right for our own heart and our own emotions. Do you know why people don't speak up against sin? It's because they're in sin themselves. Do you know how Jeffrey Epstein was able to go this long doing what he has done? It's because he had blackmailed some of the most powerful political figures that we have ever known. And this information will come out and we will know exactly what happened and who was with him and what went down. Here's what Satan wants to do. Here's his scheme. He wants to trick you in the trap of sin so you can't stand up against it. Well, I'm guilty after all. Who am I to stand up against this sin or this wickedness or this thing? You see the scheme? 
If you put on the righteousness of Christ, God, I am forgiven. If you put on the righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, I want to do the right thing, you can start battling back against Satan and his schemes. This war is real. This war is serious. And Paul wants us to put on the righteousness of Christ. And so I'll end with this passage of Scripture. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says this. We've been talking about rulers, principalities, and powers. Here's what he says. When he has disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Look at this. The principalities, the rulers, the regulations that are at work against you are defeated through the cross. 